Okay, so we're live. Welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Bork, and we're Deliberty's number one podcast. We are the best podcast in the Liberties. Yes. Come on, the Liberties. Liberties Dublin, eh? Okay, so we're live. Welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Bork, and we're Deliberty's number one podcast. We are the best podcast in the Liberties. Yes. Come on, the Liberties. Liberties Dublin, eh? My home, my place that's so close to my heart. I just love it. It's great to bring you a podcast from the Liberties. It's an amazing place. If you haven't been here, come on over. Come visit us. You'll absolutely love it. Today's interview is with a guy called Dave Collins. Absolutely brilliant. I love this interview. He is the co-founder of Ashtanga Yoga Dublin, himself and his wife, Paula. I came across David a couple of months ago when I sat through one of his introductory course to Pranayama. He's a yoga teacher. So I was really taken aback by his style of delivery. You know, I'm very intrigued by people when they teach something because I think it's that essence that we connect to when we want to learn something. You know, whether you want to go to counselling, when you want to learn a new skill or a hobby, it's really important to be able to connect with the teacher. And I really connect and I love this teaching style. So I wanted to know a little bit more about him and I read about him and a friend of mine, Fiona, Lacey, she has studied under him and a, another guy, the job done it. So I was really fascinated by him and, and I read a little bit about him. So I said, I'd love to have him on. So I got him on and he has a fascinating background. You know, he comes from a molecular biology. He's done some acting and then he, he, he now practices yoga and teaches yoga. And he has this whole spiritual practice. And I just love the conversation. We touched on consciousness. We touched on love and kindness. My currency, currency that I always talk about. Uh, we talked about a word awareness and yoga and the the philosophy yoga and his inspiration it was absolutely brilliant i love the you know it's a really really powerful interview it really shone a light on on it for me about you know slowing down accepting yourself stop pushing like push 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 and of course the interview is called opening your heart to love and we touched on a lot of that so i absolutely love the interview hopefully you will really enjoy it as much as i do as I did. Uh, as always, I want to thank, thank Noel Royley from Rooney Media Graphics, Andy from Liberty's Photo.ie, uh, the girls from Shannon's Hope Lion, and Mental Health Warriors. And to you guys, thanks very much for all your feedback. Thanks very much for all the support that you give us. Please share our work on social media. Please share our work on, on all platforms. You know, uh, subscribe on iTunes share with family and friends get in contact give us your feedback let us know what you're thinking of the episode i get lovely messages on social media or facebook and instagram and it's brilliant it really encourages it really warms my heart to hear that we we are doing what we say magic mind stories that have the power to inspire and that's our that's our that's our mantra that's our heart brand we want to inspire people i am i believe that my purpose in life is to be a healer i want to inspire people to heal and we do that by telling stories, practicing love, kindness, understanding and forgiveness. As always, mind your little self, enjoy, enjoy the interview, take care. Okay, so we're live, welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Brook on the show today, I'm joined by David Collin. David, how are you doing? Good, how are you Matt? I'm good, well, at this point I would shake hands with the guests, with this whole social distance, so we're, we're virtually high for you. How are you keeping? Good, yeah, good fun. Then, guys, I've asked David to come on the show, David is the the founder of Ashtanga Yoga Dublin here in Black Rock. So I want to talk to him about his journey into Ashtanga, where, he, where what led him to this path, why his inspiration, spirituality, consciousness, and just helping me help people heal around this time, whether it's through mind, soul, or body. So look, for the people that don't know, give us a little intro about yourself and the work that you do. Well, um, Ashtanga Yoga Dublin we set up in 2002. My wife and I, uh, and she wasn't my wife then, I had even better than actually. And I started the shala initially when I changed my life path from my previous career as an actor to yoga. As, as I got more and more into yoga over time, I realized that it was not just a practice that I could do in conjunction with living a, a more normal life let's say but it became a way of living and i wanted to dedicate my time to really exploring the practices of yoga and this very ancient wisdom to try and enhance on the one hand my own health and well-being and then to be able to share whatever i experience with other people and help them to improve the quality of their lives through the practices of yoga which is the, the whole reason behind yoga was to make people healthy happy 
free from suffering, to understand themselves as human beings as clearly as possible. And so that's what, you know, small, a small goal we had, <laughs> to clear yeah. things up. Let's, behind every great story, there's always a backstory. So let's go back a little bit to the, to the, the when and where, I know from reading a bit about you, that you studied uh, molecular biology, you went on to study and you were inspired by Frank McGuinness and Apple. Tell us a little bit about that time. It's like you went from a lab coat to a sun salutation. Tell us about that. That's funny, I don't know where you found that, that uh, reference to Frank. But Is it true? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. I'll tell you the, the full story. It's, it's, it's cool actually because, um, you know, I went to school in the 70s. I asked, I was asked for a leading search by a guidance counselor, what did I want to do with my life? In school, I had been acting in the dramatic society, as it was called. And I loved it. I found there was an incredible buzz when I was discovered that something we were doing up on stage had a reaction in people and, and, and you could feel that connection. And I thought, that's cool, I want to do that. So I said I wanted to be an actor. And he kind of threw his hands up in horror and made the sign of the cross and all sorts of things. I said, you know, that's not, that's not a career path. You know, do something else. So I allowed myself essentially to be talked out of it. And my next love was science. And so when I did live school, I did a degree in, in science and trinity in, in biology, molecular and genetics, and then I went to Galway to uh, do a PhD. But while I was in Galway doing a PhD, I started acting in a local theatre workshop. And very quickly, I knew I was in trouble, that I was going to go back, or I was going to leave science at some point. It took three years. What, 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 why, when you say you, you, you felt like you're in trouble, what, what, what was, you know, like, you were, you could feel that pull, was it just, just was the inner wisp, was it this inner voice? Yeah, it's some, something about it just, you know, I loved the, the, the knowledge of science. Mm. But it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was in my head. Whereas the theatre, it's touched something in my heart. And there was a different level of, of I suppose, science was exploring the physical world and, and the realities of, or the, what we could work out about how things the work, how behave, the how. Love the how of science. And, and acting was about the how of being human. Okay. So it was about this, the, 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 so the experience was more of a, of a heart. And uh, Frank McGuinness, I went to see him talk at the theatre festival, Dublin Theatre Festival, I think it was about 1985, and he was in part of a conference which was about the creative impulse in modern theatre was the title of it, I think more or less remembering it as correctly as I can. And Frank spoke and he said this sentence. He said that for him, the creative impulse in his work was the absolute necessity to record the beating of the human heart. I just went. Oh, wow. And I literally went back to Galway after that few days in the theatre festival and told my boss I was leaving. And uh, then I went back to Dublin and told my parents. And then I went in and started a 16 year career in the theatre. Well, and it, it, it wasn't as seamlessly as that. You had some struggles around as well. It, it brought a lot of stress into like, like, I mean, these decisions, it's not all of a sudden jumping on a white horse and you're right off into the sunset. Yeah, yeah. It came with a lot of challenges as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it wasn't the case that I was completely uh, happy 100% in the science and just went in to be a happy 100% yeah, yeah. active. And um, I had not because not, not solely because of the, the decision, but generally I wasn't living healthily. I had a bad diet, I had asthma, I had eczema, I had skin issues, I smoked, I drank, I did all sorts of things that weren't conducive to, to being healthy. Not living your best life as Not really, say. not really. And uh, when I did leave science I said, Okay, I gotta get myself sorted out here and I started very slowly to look into different ways of, of dealing with the struggle and stress and health that issues that I'd had. And I came to acupuncture very quickly. And the acupuncture suggested I try yoga. Okay. So I bought a book. And I didn't open it. Got a drop in my <laughs> I didn't open it for about a year. And then I discovered that it was actually very hard to do it on your own from the book. And I started in 1987, I started, I think, the first yoga class. David Swanson? Or... 
Well, no, David didn't come into the picture for about another 10 years. Okay. Um, I started doing yoga and Aikido together and um, Zen meditation in a, a, a place in Dublin with John Rogers. And it was many, many months later, really. But at that stage, yoga in Ireland was very much kind of in its infancy and was largely practiced by that women and men were very few and far between. Um, but I, I graduated, I, I started to, to practice more and I started a teacher training course in, in 1992, finished that in 94, and then started teaching part-time. Right. I was still working as an actor all the time, as much as one had work. So oh. pretty much ongoing. You did, a couple of, you did a couple of plates spinning? Yeah, well, I mean, the, at, that, at that stage, yoga for me was, the idea of it was this was an adjunct to help me to cope with, because with, believe me, you know, whatever about science, theatre is a stressful existence. Wow, yeah. Working as an actor is a stressful life. <laughs> because while it's a joy when you're doing it, you're not always doing it, and it's a tough business to, to get a break in. Because um, you still have to put food on the table. And you still have to put food on the table. So I was teaching part-time, I was working, I was practising it through while I was working. But gradually, as I got older, practice started to take hold more. And then it came to a stage where I, I said, okay, I've been working quite a bit, I need to take a break. And when I was in that break, in, in the early part of, of this millennium, when it was about 2000, Ashtanga Yoga became kind of the focus, the full focus. And, and then I suddenly realized, actually, this is what I want to do. This, is, this means more to me now than, than the other. It wasn't, and in this case, it was a very smooth transition. It wasn't a, it wasn't an overnight stop one, start the other. Yeah. I got offered a job. I said, listen, I won't take it because I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on getting myself healthy for a bit and, and perhaps a bit of yoga. And then I got offered another the same director, offered me another job a little while later. And I said, actually, you know, I started teaching a bit of classes and, and I've got a lot of people coming now who, who want to keep going, so I'm going to keep going with that. And little by little, after a year, I had left my agency and, and uh, had retired. So Hollywood, could, Hollywood will have to wait for a few more years to get you back, will they? They never say. I read somewhere that you were you doing some energetic studies and energetic massage. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, I did. I, you know, along the way. Polarity studies as no, well. No, that was actually Paula. Oh, was it? Paula was the Paula, my wife. Paula did polarity therapy and. But did you do energy, the energy studies? I did Reiki uh, and. Reiki and a bit of a practice called Makaho Shiatsu, which is a, a, a hands-on Shiatsu, not, not just individual pressure point, but pressing areas and opening it, a bit more like Thai massage, okay. opening the joints and, and manipulating the, the limbs and working with more even pressure over an area rather than an individual pressure point. So those, you know, we, we between us we've kind of tapped into a lot of different things with, with yoga, Ayurveda, the massage therapies, Reiki, the energetic healing, all of these things have all played a role in getting us to where we are now, I suppose, in terms of our understanding of how these combination of things, how we, how we work as not just a physical entity, but we've got to work on ourselves physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, to, to, to clear all these levels of our, our um, bodies, our energetic body, our spiritual Body, everything has to has to come into to kind of be integrated and work in harmony. In alignment. Yeah, so it's like it's like almost turning wheels till everything lines up and all the cards, and then the lock opens, so to speak. Then the energy moves up, and uh, yeah, all is good. Have you done have you done much work around chakras and energy systems, as in the different chakras? You know, head, crown. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's part of the of them. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that my my experience of it is very much from the the, the sensation of, of working in the, the different postures and working with the breath to to feel how we can start to open and energize and move energy from the base. Like we have, there are seven chakras that are described. There are actually more above and more below, but the seven and the uh, so we from root sacral. Manipur, the third heart center, throat center, and the third eye, we can call it in, in common parts, and then the crown. And I suppose if you, I visualize it like uh, as an image, you could think of it as, as an electrical circuit where you have a, 
a light bulb at each of this, these junctions. And when everything is working in harmony and the energy is moving correctly through your system, then it will go up and light the first bulb, then the second bulb, then the third bulb, and the end will want the energy to reach out to the crown. So we're, we're trying to get um, clarity through all of our systems. So the, you know, the base is associated with security, stability, groundedness being earthed, allowing that energy to come up that supports us and we feel safe and secure. The second chakra more into the experience and, and enjoyment of the experience of being alive and, and um, an emotional level. The third, um, you know, there's a, the, the, the sun chakra we call it and, and this is where we really want to uh, have this Manipura chakra, the center, the jewel center to, to be penetrated so the energy moves up to there and then the, the physical and the emotional and the mental are all starting to come together and, and harmonize. And we get to the third, the fourth chakra, the heart space. So the space of the spiritual heart is where we really find ourselves and our capacity to live compassionately and openly. And you know, if we're, if we're fearful or anxious, you know, you can feel that there's a closing down in your chest. And if we can get to the point of, of not holding things, we try to protect ourselves. You know, it's like the physical reaction of an animal to go yeah, yeah, yeah. like this. Back into yeah. the field position. Yeah, we close down the heart. And you can feel when, you're, when your heart center is constricted. So if you can open that by, by focusing in there and seeing this space and allowing the, the energy to open up so that we, even though we might be afraid and there might be things that we're experiencing that are t temporarily anyway unpleasant, it'll pass through us and move on much more readily. Mm. And the sense of, of, of release when you open the heart center and you can feel this energy moving up and you kind of, and it's, it's like, what do you feel when you're in love? Wow, everything is cold, everything is open. And then you start to be afraid. What happens if it goes away and something starts to close, you start to forget. If we can stay open all the time, life unfolds much more naturally and much, much more easily. As you said, you allow the energy through, through you, even though it's negative energy or it's horrible. When you open up a pass, it's true, you experience and lean into it. And I found that with, with that, like lately, I open my hands for my yoga, I raise my head, or for my, my meditation, I open my, I raise my head, I open my hands, I open my legs. I'm sending signals to my body that I'm open. I'm open for light, I'm open for love and energy. I think that has really helped me. Well, you know, this is, the, oh, yoga is entirely about it this journey of opening to our, our deepest nature, I suppose. So we open the body by trying to balance the activity of, of the, the muscles, the organs, all the systems so that nothing is, nothing is holding on. You know, if you tense a muscle, imagine if you were to go around with your fist clenched all the time. Yeah. It's a huge effort. It's also sending signals to your brain that things, something is dangerous, something is, something is, is uh, to be to be worried about, and it does all sorts of things to your your biochemical, physiological activity in the body. Speeds up your heart rate, speeds up your breathing, shuts off circulation to other organs, that, so your digestion might get affected. You're, you're, you're in a constant state of anxiety. So the yoga postures, the working at the physical level, and a lot on the first chakras are start, is starting to open the system so that we restore balance, and there's no tension, unnecessary holding in the body. Mm -hmm. And then with the breath, we go in and release the nervous system, parasympathetic, sympathetic balance. So we're again not in this fight or flight kind of state, but more in the rest, digest, and everything can be smooth and easy. Yeah. And then the mind starts to settle. So the breath, the connection between body, breath, mind, if you think of it. If you're upset, how do you breathe? Quick and fast, yeah. quick and fast. Yeah, yeah. And it becomes very broken. If you're okay. really calm and smooth and everything's hunky dory, then. And I hold my breath. When I'm, when I'm anxious, or I can always do it. And then I go. <sighs> yeah, I mean, what's, what happens if, if you get a start? Somebody startles you, or you're. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything stops. Everything breath. freezes. Yeah, breath freezes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a line in one of the yoga texts that says, um, when the breath is, is. The way the breath is moving is the way the mind is moving. And the way the mind, uh, uh, if we calm the breath, effectively we calm the mind. I think I read that Osho's book. And you can see, yeah, I'm sure they, they, they all, they all, the, 
this wisdom is universal from, from these traditions. So by working on the breath, we calm the nervous system, we balance that, and the mind starts to quieten down. And eventually, when we find this place where, where we become really still, thinking stops. And when thinking stops, whew, then you, you know, thinking stops for everybody when they're asleep and not dreaming, but they're not conscious of it. So if you can do that while you're awake, consciously become present and know, knowing by, be, by awareness that you're not thinking, you suddenly experience a whole different level of your being. And that's the, the kind of the real you. It's the one who's kind of in there all the time. It's the one that was there when you were a baby, when you were a kid, when you were a teenager, when you were an adult, when you are an old person. Something is constant. Everything else is changing. The body is changing. Spirit is the spirit. The spirit, the inner you, the bit that makes you alive, isn't changing. And it's watching all this change. And it's always perfect. And it's always serene. And it's always calm and healthy and clear. Can't be affected by anything. So even when you're in a situation like COVID and hard and things are bad, and times of trouble, grief, pain, anxiety, fear, whatever it may be, if you can connect to that inner self, open the heart and allow all that stuff to flow through and realize that the, the core of your being is unaffected. It can really help to deal with all of that. And the rest is just, as let's say, white noise, thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences. We can just sit and watch. I know it's, it's difficult for some people, but really all we are is, is conscious awareness, isn't it? Yeah, ultimately. I mean, if we, when, when, we, when we start to, to understand that you've, this, this consciousness, this awareness, as you call it, is expressing itself through us in different ways. It's like the, the um, you know, electricity expressing itself through a radio express, uh, or speaker expresses itself as sound, expressing itself through a light bulb that expresses itself as light. So consciousness expressing itself through the body expresses itself as the perceiver. I experience things, I see, I hear, I feel. Expressing itself through the mind, it expresses itself as the feeler. I feel emotions. Expressing itself through the intellect, it expresses itself as the thinker, I think. So we have I feel, I think, I perceive. But who's this I? So if we quieten all the activity of the perceptions through yoga postures and becoming still, just eventually you just sit quietly with no disturbance, then I, the perceiver, the perceiving stops, there's just the I. When we calm the emotions, the feeling stops, not that we're suppressing something, it's just in the moment we're neutral. The feelings are not there, no feelings, no feeler, just the I. No thoughts, thinking stops, intellect is quiet, no agitation, no conflict in the mind, then no thinking, no thoughts, just I. And this I is what we experience when we become quiet like that. In the silence of the body, the mind, the body, the breath, the mind being brought to a place of, like it would be in the forest or the sea when it's nature, in nature you feel it more readily. And that consciousness then we experience directly is who we really are. And when we experience that, everything changes. Because you can never lose that again. Yeah. They say in, in, in Bhagavad Gita it says, if we, if we make this experience, we realize that no other experience in the kind of sensory sense could possibly be better than this. And so it's, it's worth uh, chasing it, worth working to get it. And once you get it, even the greatest sorrow can be coped with. Have you got it? Have you achieved? Have you found me yet? Have you become the enlightenment? My teacher said a great thing to me recently, one time I said to him, because he, he said to me one morning, uh, we were, we were, Who is your teacher? Um, a man called Sutir Tuari. Sutir yes, Tuari. A, a, a teacher at the moment, a main teacher, and he said, I said to, he said to me, Ah, David, how are you today? I said, yeah, pretty good today. Are you happy? I said, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I said, I bet you're always happy. And he said, I'm not always happy. I'm very rarely sad. And I thought, that's pretty cool. That's, that's a good start. So I kind of, I kind of yeah, think, you know, I know I have many moments where I fall back into the 
feeling, thinking, perceiving part. Because it's always there at the same time. It's not that they're separate. It's not like you have one and the other goes away. Because we live in the world. And we've got to live in the world. We've got to live normally. We've got to do our work. We've got to raise our children. Mm -hmm. We've got to look after each other. We've got to do all the things that we have to do. But if we can do that with, a con with an awareness of, of this inner peace, then we can do all that better and more live a more fulfilled, happy, healthy life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I'm not there yet. By a long shot. You haven't, I, you I haven't have started to walk on water yet. You know, <laughs> levitating. No, not yet. Not this week. These are things that, these are things that we, we try not to go into. You know, they're not <laughs> they're secrets. Things, they're distractions <laughs> from the past. You know? Was there a point, was there a point though when your awareness, when you became aware of your awareness? For me, my awareness, I began to see colours more brightly, I've seen flowers more beautiful without description. I'm just more present. Now, it's only glimpses because my monkey mind takes over and I ding, 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 the intellect. Was there a point for you where you know, like, ah, was there any aha moment? Then, yeah, the one, occasionally there are, the, well, that general aware, that, that, that beautiful awareness that you describe is it. You know, it, 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 that is it. Then, then, when you take away the labeling, when you experience something like the bird song that we've been hearing these beautiful mornings, and and you're not, your mind isn't drawn to comment on it, and you just experience it, then you're there. That's it. That is it. That is, it. That is the present moment. Because in the th in the thinking mind, we're always in the past or the future, but in the non-thinking, we're always in the present. There was a thing happened. Um, I read a book recently enough, which is quite harrowing and uh, about, about the refugee crisis from, from Syria and uh, it affected me a lot and, and I, was, I was meditating a lot at the time and it was almost like the, the stuff in the book was so rough that I had to, I had to go really deep to, to get into the, being able to even deal with the fact that humanity was capable of this stuff. Mm. And then I became really conscious, really much more aware of this inner consciousness uh, when I was, I was in meditation. That was cool. And then it goes away again at a level and it comes back. But I suppose once, once you know it's there, you kind of have this feeling like, okay, there's a great story that, that I heard once at Grace, my daughter's school, um, and there was, it was kind of a church service, and we were talking about uh, this guy who was very deeply religious, and he was, he was connected to God, and, and um, I have to remember how, how the story is, he was walking, he always felt that he was walking with, with, with God, and uh, that there were two sets of footprints in the sand, oh, so to speak, you know it? Okay, uh, anyway, it, and, uh, the gist of it was that he, he's having a tough time and he sees only one set of footprints and he thinks God has abandoned him and he kind of complains and says, where are you God? Why am I only seeing one set of footprints? He says, it's not because I left you, it's because I'm carrying you. So, you know, that's the idea. When you know that this presence is there all the time to, to, to be with you in the toughest times and actually if you take recourse to it and learn how to instead of getting pulled into the, the, the thinking and the emotions, let them be there, let them be there, but don't don't fight them, don't get stuck in them. Try and go back and watch from, from the, with the support, knowing that you're supported by this unchangeable, permanently pure, blissful consciousness. I know it might sound wacky to people, but it's... Those are the main things. Yeah, well, that's great. That's why it's great to talk to people who, who no. also. <laughs> no, because I, I went through some difficult times from 2011 up to 2015. I've had difficult times over here where I had this inner knowing that all would be okay. I just knew that everything would be okay. The intellect, the mind was trying to process everything that has happened in the past because I never dealt with it. But there was a knowing in me, like that, we want to call it God, divine, love. Oh, you might want to say love because love is just my currency right now all the time. I just knew I could be okay. I knew I was being guided and now I'm being brought by a higher power. And that's not what I'm It's Jesus, Allah, whatever. And that's okay. But there's something. There's a greater pull. Yeah, and you know, um, Paula came up yesterday and did a contemplation in the class with it um, on Buddhist four thoughts for, and I can't even remember what all four of them are, and um, it just shows you where my mind was, um, for transforming your life. And you know, one part of it was to say, is it the four truths? Perhaps, yeah. The, the, 
you know, I have the choice to dedicate my time, my life, to growing in wisdom and compassion. And if you think about it, we're so caught up in the day-to-day -day survival, for want of a better word, the humdrum activities of life, that we forget, you know, that the real essence of being human is that, that, that loving compassion that you're talking about. And that's what we really, you know, if we, if, we, if we can get in touch with that, all the rest will fall into place and will be supported because that's the nature of things. So I, I really brought it down and here's a, t a, 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 a principle of Taoism. Everything for me is love or fear. Like, I'd ask myself, are you practicing here from love or fear? I'd make it really black and white. You know, if I'm being cautious, I'm being judgmental, if I'm being impatient. To me, that's fear. Love is understanding, compassion, forgiveness, openness, presence. And it's really, really, it's, it's really been very black and white for me now. There's no, like, even when I say to people, how are you? And they say, grand, I've always said to you, between one and ten, but you can't say five. That splits the hairs. Are you six, are you four? Because that then tells you, you kind of can check in with yourself. You know where you're at. So why then you know where you're in the fear or love? Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing of, uh, if we open the heart, we live from love. If we close the heart, then it's from fear. It's from protection. This could, this could be that tricky for me, this could be dangerous. You know, the, you know as Shakespeare said, it's better to be loved than lost. I never looked at all. It's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Who are your who what uh, leaders or uh, people that you've had in your life that have been influential to you? Well, you know, um, there have been lots of lots of teachers along the way. At all in all three areas. You see, I don't think you ever do anything or get anywhere without there being a reason for it. And so the the, the, the movement from from science through acting through yoga actually for me makes perfect sense. It's kind of from, from the physical to the psychological to the spiritual. In a way, that's how I grew. Without wishing to, to uh, state the obvious, as if Paula is obviously an enormous uh, influence for me. Through Paula and Grace, my daughter, I really learned the meaning of love. And I don't mean that in just a sort of romantic love sense, but just the, the the complete letting go into love. So for they, as 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 human beings with whom I share my life, they've been they're the most influential. Along the way in yoga, there have been lots of teachers from uh, the very first teachers that I worked with here in Ireland, Marlene French Mullen and, and, and Paula Carazzoni, up through like lots and lots of, of, of really great people up to Sutir and his dad. Sutir and Paul Dallin, an Irish guy from from Kalani, fantastic teacher. Led, led us to the pranayama practice, the breathing practices. His teacher was, was Opi Tuari, Sudhir's dad. And that kind of, Paul brought us into that family and that, that became a huge influence for us. Um, there, there's a couple in, in Mysore that I worked with back in, in the, about 2005, 2006, 2007, who really started to open me up to the philosophy, to the Bhagavad Gita and, and, and the Yoga Sutra. So it's almost like a, on the website I don't list them anymore because there's so many people who have, who have influenced me. But um, that 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 lineage of, of um, teaching in, in Kaivalya Land Institute in, in, in India, which was founded by a man called Swami Gurudevananda, that that was a, that's a really clear kind of for me a, a really a return to the. Uh, the distillation of, of Ashtanga Yoga into its real meaning, you know, what its purpose was, how the practices should be done, how to do them safely and to get the best benefit from them. So both, both the physical practices, the asana, the postures and the breathing, and then not losing sight of how do we live, you know, it's about how do we behave with other people and what sort of lifestyle do we lead ourselves. We have to get those things as a correct foundation. Yeah. And so, you know, there are many, many, you know, you just now have access to all the teachers online or in books or stuff, you know. And of course, the personal interaction makes it hugely different. So to have Sudhir come and live with us in our house, cook our meals, you know, this guy comes over, he's supposed to be the teacher, and, and he comes and he takes and does all the cooking. 
and he's just this gentle, humble, incredible human being who, who really teaches us more by the example of how he lives than by anything else. That's, and, that's an awful thing. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and he, uh, he gives of his time and, and he gives of his knowledge. And you can see he was raised with it. He grew up in this institute and, and he, was, he, he had yoga from, from birth, basically. So it's, uh, even though he lived in the West and has, has, has worked as an engineer or has earned different jobs, and, you know, he had this, tr this tradition of living. And, and so it's imparted from the heart and from the depth of personal experience. So that's a really great thing. Um, what else? You know, and there's been lots, of, lots, of, lots, of, lots of people really in yoga, and and uh, I you know, I've got, to, I've got to offend somebody by leaving somebody out. Lino, Lino was a, our first Italian yoga teacher who, who, who introduced me to the, the physical practices of Ashtanga, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but the common trait I'm, I'm getting from all your your your, your people that have been influential in your life is love and compassion, and you know, humble, you know, just pure forms. In other forms, for me, it's of love. Yeah. You know, have a, they have a common trait. That's really what I wanted to tap into. Was there was there any lessons in life that were your greatest teachers that you can you share with us? You mean from life. normal life? Just any life, anything less, you know, lessons in life, or experiences, or periods that, that, that were teachers for you. You know, I don't want to be pulling out. Uh, there, was a, there was a moment in yoga practice one time. I went to Miami in 2002, and that was when I, I was uh, kind of saying, okay, this is the transition period. And I was practicing one day, and it was very, very. There was a lot of bodies in the room, and there was a lot of really advanced practitioners. And I was there with a kind of wonky knee and pasty white skin, and, and <laughs> not very flexible and all this. And I had a moment of of of, of sudden surrender to that. I said, "It's okay. You don't have to be." The bendiest. You don't have to be anything other than the way you are. And as soon as I let go of the kind of feeling of need to be seen to do something or be seen to be some way, then I kind of became free. Because then there's, there's no, there's no, there's no, um, no that's, that's, not a, that's not a very profound one in some respects. It's just a, a sudden moment of, you know, if I let go of expectation or attachment to a particular result, then I'm free. I don't have any, any dangers. I think that is very profound because it's, the magic is in the orbit. Just for anyone just to accept as they are, whether it be tall, small, overweight, underweight, just, you know, this is just the way I am right now. So you were just saying in the middle of a practice, you've just said, you know what, this is it. And I've had those experiences when I've seen people doing crazy moves and I'd be judging myself, saying, oh, they have a sword, they have all the answers. My mate says to me, she's probably over there doing all those great moves, but her mind might be monkey mind, won't worry about what the worry about her about that. And I went, wow, that really nailed it for me. So now we just go in, this is just it. Yeah, the most important thing is, is not what you can do, but why you do it and how you do it. And then what the, what's the result? Is there, you know, you can do yoga for two hours on the mat and then live 22 hours in anxiety. And that's not that's not the yeah, that's not what yoga is trying to get you to. Yoga is trying to get you to live twenty four hours in calm and peace and harmony. Transferable skills. And, the, and the, the, the hours on the mat have to be not an escape from 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 the normal life, but a, a way of making you more uh, well equipped to live with the ups and downs of life. Okay, as you said earlier, in a junction. Like it's supplementary life, you know, like people going to the gym and thinking an hour and a half on the cross trainer will uh, negate all the, the negativity, the stress, the poor diet, the drink, the drugs, whatever. You see? And same with the yoga, people come and do one or two classes a week and hope that they will reap that benefits. It's still the way around, it's still the 23 hours a day is what you need to be looking at, really, isn't it? To, yeah, to try. I mean, it's, it's, 
and it's it's something that grows. You know, it's mm. not it's not you don't go from naught to sixty and, and suddenly transform. So by putting in, you know, we have to put in a little effort. We have to do the practices, and we have to try to find a way to do them in the right way, mm. and in a way that's appropriate to our current circumstance and condition. And then you feel you start to feel the changes happening as without giving up anything or without having to go, all oh, right, that's it, now I've stopped all that and I'm going to live pure and right. Right. it doesn't work. No. You, you've got to just do a little bit of practice and strengthen that sort of aspect of you so that the, the qualities of the spiritual heart, the qualities of, of compassion and love start to express themselves because they're always in there, but they're blocked over, they're covered over by, by the kind of tensions in the holding. So we start to release the tensions and holding the love and compassion flow naturally through. Beautiful. Mm, yeah, simple enough. But, uh, simple but not easy. Sounds simple. It's uh, in theory but put into practice. But as you said, and I've picked this up through all our conversations, it's slowly, it's like a ship moving in a dock. You know, you never move the ship in two days, three weeks. It's slowly starting to tip around and all of a sudden you're in that direction and you slowly move on. That's the way I found my practice. Yeah, you, you don't even notice, you know. Um, what 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 you what what you discover if you look back then over time you'll discover things start to unfold more easily. Mm. And you go, how did that work out? Wow, isn't it amazing how that worked out? You know, Paul and I are always looking back and go, that's incredible really when you think about it. When you start joining the dots, it's the that, that, says. This this work this 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 just Apparently, effortlessly unfolded. So it unfolds with ease, you know. Generally, yeah. when we're not when we're not chasing it. As you said earlier, the muscle tight, hold, push, force, resistance. When we open up, things move more freely. The world moves freely. You are more You're open. You're more. more yeah, and you know this. This may sound a wacky one, but you know, if you're hanging by your fingernails on a cliff, that's really hard. The holding on is really hard. Letting go is actually easy. <laughs> but we're afraid to fall. So we don't let go. But if we let go in life, instead of holding on and thinking we're going to protect ourselves from something, we let go and let ourselves fall into life, then it actually proves to be easier. The whole reason I, I came across was I sat with you and done a class with Pranayama. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. I loved your teacher style. It was brilliant. Can we talk about that? Well, maybe talk about Ashtanga, what it is, uh, and Pranayama together, maybe, just to educate people on that. I loved it. Okay, well, if we look at what Ashtanga is, in, in terms of, of the, the full meaning of it, it's made up of two words. Ashta means eight, and Anga means branches. So there's a, a text called the Yoga Sutra, and a man called Patanjali tried to put together all of the kind of the wisdom of yoga in a, a packageable form. So sutra means thread. So he sewed a thread of, of wisdom in, in about 195 short aphorisms or sayings that people could remember. And basically he said, if you want to calm the mind down and experience this inner peace, you got to practice the eight limbs of yoga or the eight branches of yoga. He said these are the first branch, is a cultivate behavior that's conducive to being happy in life. So, obviously, these are things like non-violence, truth, not stealing, moderation and everything, not being selfish. And you find living those ways are actually, is actually better. So it's, how do you relate to your fellow man in a compassionate way? Then, how do you live a lifestyle that's conducive to health? looking after your body, looking after yourself, what you eat, what your information you expose yourself to, doing some practices, doing some study of yourself through meditation, exploring what it is to be human, surrendering, attachment. Mm -hmm. So those are the first two. The life, the behavior and the lifestyle, they're the foundation. And then postures for the body, the third limb, breathing exercises for the nervous system and mind, Concentrating well, first he said, Okay, let's go inwards. External body, more subtle nervous system through the breathing exercises, 
senses. You know, we interact with the world through our senses. We're gaining and taking in information from the world through the senses all the time. But we're also being pulled into sensory attraction all the time. So we see something, we get drawn to it. So we're always, our attention is directed outwards. Whereas if we want to direct the attention inwards, then we have to withdraw our attention from the outer world. So we have to master the senses. If we're really kind of stuck in the sensory uh, attraction, it becomes an addiction. And we get really caught up then we can. So we learn to, to be able to, to leave what we hear and what we see and what we touch and what we feel and taste and smell and go quiet. So the fifth stage or the fifth branch is sense control or sense mastery as we call it. They say something sense withdrawal. And then concentration. So the postures clear up the perceiver that we talked about earlier, the eye, the perceiver, the activity of the body and the senses and balance it. The breathing exercises, the fourth limb pranayama, that balances the nervous system and starts to quieten the mind. The sense withdrawal completes that process and then we can focus the mind without distraction. That's the sixth limb concentration, the sixth branch of Ashtanga. So we've done body, mind, breath, a body, breath, mind on the basis of behavior and lifestyle. And what happens then is the last two limbs we can't do anything about. They, they, they evolve. So absorption or meditation arises when the mind becomes still. So when we become steady in the body, calm in the nervous system, the mind quietens down, then we have the experience. And that's the seventh stage, when we get a glimpse of that consciousness that you talked about, when we get a glimpse of our inner nature, and we start to feel, ah, now I know I'm being supported, I'm being carried. That thing is always with me. The love of compassion is in me all the time. I don't have to look for it. I just have to uncover it. So that's like a only product of the other stages. Yeah. So the practical stages bring about the effect. And the effect is first that we become capable and, and of being totally present, 100%, and not distracted. So the monkey mind ceases to be a monkey and becomes the one-pointed mind can stay with one thing and one thing only. And eventually, that becomes samadhi, the eighth stage, this state of, of, of blissful awareness, of, of pure being. Wow, that just answered my ne next question, because I ask a lot of my guests, that, you know, whether it be doctors and psychology or psychiatry, how do we move from our head to our heart over all the years? So we start 10 years now in self-development, counseling, reading, spirituality. I've always had this difficulty of coming from my head, I'm always intellecting, ding, 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 ding. I do my best business when I come from my heart. And that has just answered the question. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 uh, there's a great teacher called Mr. Iyengar who, who died you know, a couple of years ago. He was one of the, one of the kind of um, triumvirate of, of teachers in the last century in India, uh, all of whom passed away in, 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 in the last 10 or 12 years. Patabha Joyce in Mysore, who was the kind of the guru of Ashtanga Yoga, as it's practiced largely in the West, which is more a physical practice, primarily in the way it's come into the West. It's not what he intended it to be, obviously, either. Um, Desika Char, another great teacher, and Mr. Ayengar. And Mr. Ayengar talks all the time about we got to do yoga using the intelligence of the heart, not the intelligence of the head. The head pushes, the head wants to achieve, the head will say, go further, do harder, and practice harder, do more, look at them, they're better. Oh, it sounds it's a great. But if we go into the heart, then it's, it's pure. We come from a place of serenity and, and ease. And yeah, things unfold better than just the, the general. So Ashanga has to be this, this complete thing to be really the traditional form of it. So how you do the postures, not that important in terms of this, there are many styles of postures. People can, those three teachers, Patabi Joyce taught one style, Mr. Deskichar taught another style, Mr. Ayengar taught another style. There's many different styles of how to do the postures. But the principle of the Ashtanga system is they should always be done in a way that you're steady and comfortable, that there's no negative side effect, that there's no pain that the movement into and out of the posture is smooth and gentle and you can stay in the posture for as long as you like. 
and then you know, what, what you know when you if you achieve all that what you're doing is you're balancing you're balancing the musculature you're balancing the nervous systems otherwise you wouldn't feel steady and comfortable and that's when the result occurs that's when the conflict ceases the friction the mm, over contraction or over relax push pull push, push pull, pull defense all of that stops and that's when in Sanskrit it says blonde blah the kata then the the kind of polar opposite energies cease to compete and there's a neutral and balanced place the seesaw is level yeah well that's I mean, I think I read something you had wrote about you know physical problems emotional problems leads to you know disease and disease and when you bring that balance in that's when the system starts to calm down and put touch have you read that book called Body Holds the Score there's a book you know and it talks about your know, physical and emotional symptoms lead to disease yeah of course you know um, I mean if you think about it just that simple example if you went around like that all the time think of the knock on effect of what's going on the inflammation moment. and then the, the lack of capacity to breathe properly the pressure in the heart of increased the, uh, the stimulation of the adrenals all the time pumping out more adrenaline and cortisol the, the kind of constant over activation of the, the systems will eventually lead, you won't your digestion will suffer you won't be able to absorb nutrition the organs will start to to, to suffer the, their function will decrease illness will eventually appear so you know the, the uh, samadhi, that word that uh, means sama, adhi, same as that which is beyond, literally. It means you, 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 you reunite with that inner consciousness. And vyadhi, so you could call it integration. Integration of mind, body, breath. The opposite is vyadhi, which is the Sanskrit word for illness. Disintegration, dis-ease, disharmony. So the, the, the functioning of your organs, systems, musculature, respiration, circulation need to be in balance if we're going to stay healthy. And that's what all the practices are for, just to balance us in that way. Brilliant. If somebody wanted to do a kind of, like what way do they just attend classes and do you just learn all this within the class or do you have to, you know, if somebody wants to start on this eight limbs and did you just come and attend one class and then what's, yeah. what's, the, yeah. what's the process for somebody? Say if I was going to begin practice Ashtanga, how do you go about it? Yeah, you start, you, you, you take the, the plunge and come to your first class basically. Now obviously at the moment that's that's a, a virtual class. Zoom rooms. Zoom rooms, you know, you come online with us if you don't want to do it with us, we're on it online every day and we do a couple of different styles of classes but we try to incorporate a little bit of everything, meditation. Most of the uh, three of the classes in the week would have meditation, breathing exercises and postures and deep relaxation as, as the then two of them would have just a little bit more postures and a little bit more breathing without just a, a focusing or centering without a full scale or full scale without a longer meditation and relaxation and then one where it's a little bit more of a physical practice to, to just really get the, the physical energy moving. So it's also to, and then, you know, you start out with the body. That's the easiest thing to work with. So you start with the postures. And then after you start to do that, you start with some breathing and some sitting. Little by little, you start to find yourself drawn into, okay, let's, let's have a look at this a bit more. Well, how is this working? Why is this working? And you start to look into, and you start to go, uh, the question about that, and you go, okay, I never thought about that, maybe about that before. And we start to open up our, our awareness of, you know, where... It's not, a, it's not a, a really fast process, obviously it takes time and effort and you can say the more effort you put in, the more you get out of it. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean just, no, just no. pumping effort, but, but the, um, the process is, you know, how long is a piece of string? Where are we starting from? It depends. Everybody's different. Where are you everybody, has, everybody has a different mm, body, a different net mindset, a different breath, different levels of, of of stress, different capacity to release. All these things. So, so we just we just work with each person at the level that they're at, and we try to, to help people find a practice that's appropriate to them. So that you know we're we're planning a, an online a virtual retreat, a five day of five days of self care where we kind of say you know, come into our virtually, come into our home, 
practice with us. We'd show you our, our daily stuff, yeah. our routines, our daily practices. We would do them with you. We'd show you how we cook. We'd show you these sort of different uh, Ayurvedic, because Paula is an Ayurvedic um, consultant as well. She's, she's trained in the system of Indian health and well-being. Beautiful. So we ally the, the, the knowledge of Ayurveda and wisdom to try and really support us with the food we eat and all of these, these other things. And it's great because it's 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 like sushi cooks like that, you know, and it's it's really it's really tasty food and it's uh, you feel better after you've eaten it and it makes more sense than every single see. Wow! Now when I look back, well, of course I was unhealthy, but I think of how I lived. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, um, but that's you know our approach is really we want to know you, we want to help you discover because it's what we discovered. You know, yoga, I didn't decide to be a yoga teacher. It wasn't my plan at all. It just ended up this way. Because mm -hmm. what I experienced made me kind of go, wow, actually, you know, this is really cool. I can share this with other people. And, and uh, I started part-time and, and suddenly I was kind of going, okay, more people want to do this, I better do it more, more, a bit more often. And then the next thing I knew, this place was open. And you know, Paula met Paula at a workshop, and mm -hmm. Paula came on board kind of with the, you know, about, about six months after that, started to work with me. She was training as a teacher and she started to, to teach with me, and uh, the rest is history. Fantastic. So, uh, it, just, it, just, it just happened. <laughs> I'm always interested, I always say how people mind it themselves, because I always say how do you mind it themselves, but I'm also interested how many how do the greats live? And they say, how do you live? What's your habits? What's your daily, what's your daily routine look like? So by doing that, that's how you mind your little self for me. You know, I do meditation, gratitude lists, I train, I'm, I'm very aware of my mind, body and soul. What do you do on a daily routine? What's your, <laughs> give us the secrets. Yeah, okay. Well, how you learn how to levitate? It's, uh, it's very much like that, you know, like you described. Um, we get up pretty early. And, and I'm, 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 I'm usually now I'm certainly awake by 4, 35 o'clock, the sun is up. Uh, we now, because the weather is fantastic, we go out in the garden, we stand on our bare feet on the grass, we let that energy, absorb that energy from, from the earth, we do some gentle kind of bit of self-massage and cleansing, get the energy moving, and then usually I'll do my pranayama practice, uh, then straight after that, we do a breathing practice for maybe depends depends on the maybe forty five minutes, sometimes an hour. Do a little asana practice, get the body moving a bit more. Sometimes I'll alternate a little bit of pa pa postures first, then breathing, then meditation, and we have breakfast and go about the working day for the rest of the day, and then later on we try and sit again and. and before, before the evening, before when we sleep, we meditate again. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a kind of that's a that's almost an idealized version when we have when we have lots of time and we've had more time now recently to to it's do that. Solid, yeah, practice. So it's great. Um, and then so you know what you want to do? We want to have uh, a little bit of, of body work, a little bit of breathing. This is great. It's, uh, it's Swami Shivananda. Um, so a little bit of everything, a little bit of postures, a little bit of breathing, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of chanting, a little bit of talking, a little bit of eating, a little bit of everything. And that's how you do the you mind your little self in that way, with a little bit of everything. That's, that's, that's the ideal. I love that's it. the ideal, you know. And then I'm only learning that I like, mm -hmm. do a lot of one thing, very little or a push, pull, push, 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 because I've got this in terms of we've got to work as well. You know, we've got to mm -hmm. live. So one of the things that's why I don't want to be scaring people to think, Jesus, I have to find three hours every day to do stuff. Everything has to fit in so that it doesn't, you know, if yoga becomes another stressor, uh, then it's, it's kind of pointless. Yeah. So you have to find, okay, what can I do in my day? I, the, 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 the Bhagavad Gita tells us the first thing is, is do the things that you have to do. So you got to look after your family, you got to do your job, you got to do your practices if you in whatever way is possible. So the secret is how do you do it all without attachment? 
We do it all without thinking, oh, I need to do more to get this to be good. Or I need to do... We do everything you have to do and you make it your yoga practice. So you mean cooking for your family becomes your yoga practice. Doing your work becomes your yoga practice as well. You do the you say, okay, now I'm washing the dishes, I'm gonna wash the dishes. I'm not gonna be thinking about something else and saying I'm gonna actually feel what it's like to wash the dishes. Feel the water. Feel how this feels. And you're suddenly present. That's a yoga practice. That's consciousness taking on conscious about the yoga. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And love it. There, there's a great influence that well, I like, Yeah, I read a lot of Buddhism. I mean, I love Krishna Das as well. I love, yeah. I love, I love, because uh, I'm trying to learn to play harmonium, and uh, I use all of his his little tutorials and stuff. Yeah, right. So it's like, it's like, how can you live in as fun a way as possible? Because the other thing is, people think that living in a yogic life or an Ayurvedic lifestyle is going to be serious and boring and, and un, unfulfilling because you can't enjoy stuff. No, absolutely the opposite. It's fun. You, you discover how to, to make beautiful things that, that f- make you feel good. And 100%. Yeah. It's interesting that you say it because I was doing it, I would get a talk on mental health before a sport night and we wanted to do a meditation and I was asked what I run it. And I said, yeah, absolutely no problem going to voice now, no messing, super serious stuff. And I said, oh no, it's like a thing. I said, now, if Dick McCann says that you should smile during your meditation, if your monkey mind drifts off, you bring a half smile to your face and say, aha, look, I drifted off, come on, we come back, come on, we come back. And that was very, very powerful for me to remember that. You know, it's not super serious. You know, you, you have to do meditation. I've like, been thinking for 10 minutes here. Ha, ah, I'll just come back to me. And it, it brings a lot of ease to your, your meditation and your practice, whether it be awareness, yoga, training. There's a lightness to it. It's not super serious. Yeah, you know, you can be passionate, and ideally you should be passionate about it, without being austere or, or super... Serious, mm. you know, and I'd be, I'd be pretty serious, and, 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 and you know, because I, I love all that kind of mm. philosophy stuff and, and kind Me of the, 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 the stuff that these guys, you know, what they achieved in their by inward, you know, the inward journey into mm. self. That that really rocks my boat. Now it doesn't, it doesn't do it for everybody. But uh, so sometimes I'll get carried away and, and start talking about stuff, and people. Are like, and you have to try and, okay, let's try and keep it practical and keep yeah. it real like that. And, yeah. So it doesn't matter, yeah, exactly. Mine is jumpy, bring it back. But the only thing is you've got to keep trying to, to do it slowly, slowly. Is the Shania Shania is one of the, the lines of Bhagavad Gita as well about meditation. It says, wherever the mind wanders, gently bring it back. Gently bring it back. You know, it's not... As Jack Cornfield yeah. says, treat your mind like you would a child or a puppy. With patience, come on back, come on back, sit, stay, sit, stay. If it takes 10, 15, 20 times, just sit and stay, sit and stay. Even just that analogy, like if you just think a little oh, you fluffy puppy, sit down there. And like you wouldn't get that patient or anxious, or you're just really patient, but we do it ourselves. So when you, I know you say that people do on meditation classes, it just, you know, it just feels right. Mm-hmm. And we can treat ourselves with that patience and half a smile. Yeah. We have to be the recipients of our own compassion as well. And especially um, difficult when, when the way we live, we, we forget that actually, you know, first place I got to open my heart to is me and mm-hmm. realize it's okay. Whatever way I am, I'm okay. And I don't have to be, berate myself. You know, people are always talk, oh, I had a bad practice today and I, I couldn't focus on it. It doesn't matter. Relax. Don't be beating yourself up. We're all like that. Everybody's like that. And accept it. Look at it with dispassion. It's neither good nor bad. That's just today. Tomorrow is different. Yesterday is different. They're gone. Yesterday no more. Tomorrow hasn't come. Try and be here and now. So, here and now your experiences and mine is restless. That's okay. As Alan Watt says, there is no tomorrow. Tomorrow will just be another now. <laughs> that is, everything is just now. There's yeah, no yeah. tomorrow, there's no yesterday. This is another now. Yeah. Fascinating. I'm very mindful of your time. No, What's the one thing you would like people to take away after listening to this interview? I guess that, you know, the really important thing is to, to the, uh, the thing that I would love to be able to communicate to people with, uh, to communicate to people, is that we have within us the capacity to be 
our own solution to our problems. We can, we can learn how to look after ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, to make ourselves, to, to find the best version of ourselves that is always within us. And it's not that we need to look outside and our needs, you know, that it's not possible for me. Oh, I'm in this circumstance, it's not going to be possible. I'm in this circumstance, it makes it too hard. Or I can't do that, I can't jump around, I can't bend, I can't breathe, I can't. We always put these limitations and we think, uh, my circumstance is too difficult for me to be able to make change. But in fact, when we go quietly and gently at it, everybody, everybody has a capacity to make their lives as happy, healthy and enjoyable as possible within from themselves and that you know yeah believe in, in that that you can do it yourself you know you don't you can heal and that's why focus on life is to be a healer through by one to inspire people to heal through own kindness they will heal themselves not me I'm not the healer I'm just going to inspire you that you have the answers I will show you a mirror that's you yeah. go for it absolutely that was absolutely fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted I got the opportunity to, to, to interview you. I sat with you and done that class and I was blown away. And I'm here now. You're a fantastic teacher. You remind me of a, a teacher I had in college, Jer Corrin, and he had an amazing ability to describe. He, was, he, he taught uh, immunology and microbiology and he had to explain complicated systems through songs and dance and <laughs> analogies. And you have that same thing. You've explained, you know, consciousness, awareness, presence, back of the ether, all in a very non highbrow convoluted way that allows people in. You know, we sat with you in our class and I was very impressed with your teaching style, but the way you brought people in. So I'm absolutely delighted. I'm really honoured to have got this experience. It's such a learning for me. I'm just sitting here going, you wouldn't believe how timely this is, this whole calm, take it easy has been for me today, like, you know, it's, it's the word brings you things when you need it, the universe brings you what you need, so what's your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, I think that's, 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 that's a really, um, you know, this, uh, the, I'm sure you, you'd be well aware of this story about it, the, the student who was asking the master all the time, what's the secret, what's the secret to, to living peacefully and happily, what's the secret, and the master just sat there and didn't say anything. And the, secret, the student kept, please tell me what's the secret. And eventually got really annoyed and said, for God's sake, you're just sitting there and not answering my question. I'm asking and asking and asking. And the master went, I've been answering all the time. You guys not listening. <laughs> so, so silence is, it's only in silence. And uh, this is when, 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 we, when we become a little quieter, then we actually hear or can, can pick up on the the things that we need to learn and usually the opportunities are there but we miss them because the mind is the voice in our head is saying you gotta find something you gotta find something what do i do 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 you can go quiet inspiration comes or as they say in yoga when the student is ready the teacher appears my mate's man just said that to me last night i was asked speaking to a spiritual leader this morning he's in the philippines with tom that came up last night. He said the same thing today, and you just said the same thing to me today. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. David, where can people find you? How do they, if they want to get involved, with Ashtanga Yoga Dublin? Have you got a website? Yeah, Ashtanga.ie. I'll have all this on the, the show notes, but just um, give, give a shout out where you want people to Instagram, at Ashtanga Yoga Dublin. Facebook, Ashtanga Yoga Dublin. Um, the website, yeah, ashtanga.ie, and uh, we have the online classes currently. As I say, we're planning the online retreat, and um, yeah, we'd be delighted to hear from anybody who would like to join us in this merry journey. You know? Absolutely. Do you know what? I'm absolutely honoured. Thanks very much. I really appreciate High five, a virtual high five. Yeah. This, is, this is where we would hold and shake hands. It's so crazy not being able to do that, but yeah, I'm spiritually bugging you. Thank you, man. And I really appreciate you having had me on. It's been a pleasure. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.